So my name is Dr. Claire Madden and I've got the great privilege of being the head veterinarian at SeaWorld here on the Gold Coast down under in Australia. Hello, I'm John Rossi. I'm a touring drummer with a passion for animal conservation. When I'm on the road, I spend as much time as possible visiting zoos, aquariums, and conservation organizations. Now, I want to share those places with you. I'll be talking to keepers, vets, conservationists, anyone who can help me in my mission of connecting my people to animals through their people. Join me on my raw safari. Hello, 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 and welcome back to an all-new episode of the Raw Safari Podcast. All right, y'all, so this one is a corker, as they say down under. I am so excited to be bringing you my interview with Dr. Claire Madden of SeaWorld Australia. Um, If you don't already follow her on Instagram, uh, first of all, what the heck is is wrong with you? What are you even choosing to do with your life? But also, uh, you need to make sure that you go ahead and do that right away. It's just at Dr. Claire Madden, D-R-C-L-A-I-R-E, Madden. And um, the absolutely insane, cool, wonderful rescue work that she does and that is featured uh, on her Instagram is mind boggling. And of course, it inspired me to reach out to talk to her about all of that work, but also what her life is like as a vet at SeaWorld in Australia. So um, this is all of that. It's so cool. I could have done two or three hours with Claire. Uh, We did go over an hour in the interview, and uh, I am already hoping that she would be willing to come back on, maybe in a future season, and uh, grace us with more incredible tales. I'm not going to need to hype this up anymore because, honestly, it's so cool. You're just going to love it. So uh, before we get to the interview, just a quick reminder, make sure you hit subscribe. Uh, If you could take a moment and leave a rating, and especially if you could uh, leave a written review if you use Apple Podcasts or any other uh, apps that allow you to leave uh, written reviews. It really helps people find the podcast. Also, make sure you're following along at Raw Safari on Facebook and Instagram and threads and Twitter and at Raw Safari Pod on TikTok. And you can support the pod for as little as $3 a month by going to patreon.com slash Raw Safari. All right. Enough of that. It's time for us to head down under. I'm not even going to do the bad accent because uh, I don't want to insult Claire. And uh, let's get to my interview with Dr. Claire Madden of SeaWorld Australia. <laughs> Really? With that accent? Australia? I'm shocked. I thought you were from New York. No, okay. All right. No, no, definitely Australian. Talking through my nose, I don't think you can get a more Australian accent than what I currently have. I um I am a little bit of an actor. I'm mostly a musician, but I do some acting. And so I do some little accents and stuff. And I have tried so hard to get any kind of decent Australian accent. And uh, I just get laughed at when I try. I'm, I'm good friends with the zookeeper in Australia, Ren Howell. And uh, she literally, if I even just try, she just goes, no, no, stop. I'm like, oh, God, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it's funny hearing it in the movies. We're so used to hearing the American accent. And then when they try and do an Australian accent, you don't realize how hard it is but yes it's it's hilarious hearing people trying to replicate our accent but here it is you got it for the next however long we chat for you have my australian accent excellent and that's really what we're here for right (laughs) well hopefully we keep you the, the audience captivated Yes, definitely will. So um, right off the bat, I think we'll just tell the story of what just happened. But so we were we were trying to connect and make this happen. And we finally got it scheduled. And you had to cancel and I had to cancel and just world happens sometimes. It's all good. And then you're like, oh, I don't have headphones. And that makes the audio a lot harder for me to, to edit. And so what was your solution for that? Well, aside from initially panicking because I knew (laughs) that I was going to create extra work for yourself at your end, I ran to my veterinary equipment cupboard here behind me in my office where I sit and I grabbed the headphones that I use for our Doppler machine. So we use a Doppler to listen to a heart rate of smaller animals, more so our reptiles. And sometimes with a lot of background noise, it's quite hard to hear that heartbeat. So we use headphones. And so that's what I grabbed. I grabbed 
my veterinary equipment and I'm sitting here with these really cool looking headphones getting used for probably what they're meant to be used for. Um, <laughs> but we use them in a veterinary context here. <laughs> Oh, I love that. Because honestly, like as funny as it is, and we were both laughing, but also that's kind of what you have to do as a vet. You have to improvise. You have to, you know, there was a crisis. Granted, this is not much of a crisis, but there was a crisis and you dove into action and you came up with a unique solution for us. And I feel like that's what what being a vet is. Oh, you've hit the nail on the head. That's one of the joys of being a vet is we're constantly like detectives and problem solving and troubleshooting and trialing therapy plans and and pulling pieces together to make a find a solution for a problem that's presented to us but it's more so true in the zoo and wildlife world so as a vet we're trained on these you know five basic animal models which are largely our domesticated species because we know so much about it and being a zoo and wildlife vet we need to adapt and modify what we know more so to apply to the variety of species that we deal with. Absolutely. I'm curious, though, how important is it um, to start with a really firm foundation in those, those you know, domestic animals and the things? Do you think it's good to, to get a, a firm footing with, like, cats and dogs and stuff like that before uh, moving on to more exotic stuff? Absolutely. From a veterinary context, it is so important that you get those solid foundations in medicine and your surgical skills from those domestic species because first principles still apply. Wound management, still wound management. Surgical approach is still surgical approach. What is, however, useful is the handling and the husbandry and the animal behaviour. I had a little bit of experience before I became a zoo vet as a zookeeper and I really tapped into those skills as a zookeeper, being able to read animal behaviour and husbandry, which has become beneficial in my role. But as a vet and purely talking veterinary, it is really important to hone in on those domestic species before stepping into the exotic world. Nice. Cool. Very good to know. Um, spoiler alert. I, I know I hadn't mentioned this yet, but um, my wife is a veterinarian. Um, she's about a year and a half out of vet school now, wants to be a zoo vet, uh, but is currently working in domestics and, and sometimes I think feels a little stuck and, and as she's still learning um, and like she's not moving forward enough. But, but would you argue that maybe that's that's a good place to be for a little bit to really be getting that down? That absolutely is a good place to be at and I did the exact same path that she's currently experiencing now. Even though I had that zookeeping foundation and experience before coming to vet school and, and getting my veterinary qualifications, I still got out and did a few years in the domestic world um, to cement those veterinary skills and I too had a feeling of I'm never going to break into the zoo and wildlife game. There's just not enough opportunities and I felt a bit stale and felt like opportunities weren't coming to fruition for me, but didn't mean that I gave up. I kept persisting and kept applying and kept putting myself out there until opportunities came my way. Nice. Very cool. And you're in a heck of an opportunity right now. Uh, what a great what a great position. I'm really excited to talk about it. But let's start off by talking about like your past. We've we've touched on it a little bit, but um, what what got you into animals? What did you initially go to school for? Tell me about that. Yeah, look, it's it's the number one question that I talk about with friends, colleagues and family members more so because I wasn't the kid that got raised on a farm or I didn't have multitudes of animals in my life as, as I was being raised. My family were in a very sporting family. So the animal and the nature um, passion that I had, which I had from such a young age, we really don't know where that came from. Um, my father still to this day believes that there were, must have been one defining moment when I was a young kid that really did pave this deep-seated passion that I do have for animals. So from a very young age, primary school, high school, right through to my university studies, I knew what I wanted to do and that was to do wildlife conservation. Um, becoming a vet wasn't on my radar at the beginning of my career path, but um, it certainly became a, a clear option for me as I wanted to do more uh, for, for conservation and for the scientific field. Um, so yeah, so from a very young age, I don't know what that defining moment was, but I was focused, I was determined and somewhat a little bit stubborn. <laughs> Nothing was going to get in my way. I was going to leave school and I was going to be working with wildlife. All right. That's cool. And then um, so uh, in Australia, do you have to like do you have to get a bachelor's to become a zookeeper or, you know, what did you what did you study? What was your path to that? 
Yeah, so after graduating from high school, I went straight to university and did do a bachelor's and majored in wildlife biology. And I actually did a fourth year, so that was a three-year degree, and actually completed a fourth year of studies, which was a postgraduate year looking at echidnas, which are a really incredibly cool Australian native animal. And I hope you all know what an echidna is. Yes, I have met three different echidnas, uh, maybe four now, in, in my various zoo travels where I've actually gotten to like pet and, and you know, experience them they are the weirdest coolest animals and i love them so much that's awesome that you just yeah, casual you're you know hanging out with the kidnas that's awesome <laughs> yeah they are you you hit the nail on the head they are so unique looking they're they're unusual characteristics yet so cute and an egg laying mammal like that what a unique physiological feature for an animal to have and they're australian so i spent a year um studying those guys uh, before I became a zookeeper, um, went in and did a few years at a, at a few of the different zoos here in Australia as a zookeeper, working with both native and exotic species. Before I wanted to take my conservation further and I needed to do further studies to do that, um, was actually planning on going back and doing further postgraduate studies on echidnas. And speaking to people, they said, look, being an echidna specialist isn't going to send you around the world, but becoming a veterinarian will send you around the world. So I decided to take the path into vet school and, and conduct my veterinary studies, which is a five-year degree here in Australia, like most places. Um, and during my undergraduate as a vet, I was getting myself out there at all the different zoological institutions here in Australia and, and doing placements and trying to get my foot in the door. Nice. Very cool. Um, and then uh, did you did you get to SeaWorld right away or did you did you have some, you know, vet work elsewhere? Yeah, so no, SeaWorld didn't come straight away and SeaWorld didn't come easily. I, I certainly worked hard for this opportunity. Uh, so upon graduating from vet school, I actually did a small animal internship at a local veterinary specialist hospital here on the Gold Coast, uh, where I, I did a rotating internship between uh, medicine and surgery. Um, and then basically I, I went on and did emergency medicine. So I w was working weekends and night times as an emergency clinician. And during the day, trying to trying to get that opportunity into the zoo and wildlife world, I was casual at a few of the local wildlife facilities here in, in southeast Queensland on the Gold Coast, waiting patiently and somewhat uh, impatiently at times, waiting to secure myself a full-time employment within a zoo. Um, and I was able to do that at about three years out of vet school, uh, got a job, a full-time position down at Zoos Victoria, which is in the southern parts of Australia. They have three zoological facilities attached Attached and, and was lucky enough to, to secure a full-time position there. Um, during all of this time, whilst I was juggling all of these opportunities, some of which were happening all at the same time, I had um, developed a good relationship with the, the previous vet that was working here, Dr. David Blyde, and he was very kind enough to offer me incredible opportunities to come and shadow him uh, when he was doing procedures and to see some of the work that he was doing on the ground here at SeaWorld. And that was the golden opportunity for me was, was that man alone. Without him, I wouldn't be here. Um, but also just getting myself out there and in taking hold of those opportunities that he allowed for me. And um, fortunately for me, he was ready for retirement and I was part of his retirement plan. And so it was a little bit of an opportunity in getting myself out there, but also very much a lot of being in the right place at the right time. Um, and things happen for a reason. If you follow your passion and follow your heart, um, I am a firm believer that things will evolve and opportunities will arise. And I think that was just the case with SeaWorld. I love that. I love that so much. Um, passion is my number one like word. I say it all the time. I say you will be successful if you're passionate. I actually have a philosophy that I think most people in this, this world are so wildly unhappy and so dependent on external stimuli and maybe even bad things and stuff because they don't find or don't follow their passion and they spend all day sleeping and working on something they hate. And, you know, I just I think passion is so important. So that's really cool to hear you say that. Um, I love that message. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I was it, the passion thing. It sounds so cliche, but it's so true. You know, it. You know, study. I was never, as I said, I was raised in quite a sporting family, and sport was quite a big component of my childhood. Academia was not the pathway that my parents were taking me down, and so I never really was the studious or the straight A student coming through. You know, primary school and high school. But as soon as I hit university, and I was learning something that I wanted to learn about, I wanted to learn more. And I started to do really well at it. So it even goes to show that, you know, being able to apply yourself to a passion, you're going to do well regardless. So it does sound cliche, but it does make sense. If you immerse your world and your life with something that you want to be doing, you're going to do well at it. Yeah, no, and I, I love that. Like I said, I, I am with you. I could I could just talk about this all day, but then that would be, uh, you know, a disservice to my audience. So we will move on. But I am very with you on that. Um, but so let's talk about what your job is is like now, because uh, I got to tell you, you got a really cool Instagram. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, it's a really good platform. I'm certainly do not come from a media or marketing background, but having these social platforms like Instagram, and I've just recently tapped into TikTok, but I'm Ooh. still still learning, still very much on my old plates when it comes to TikTok. But it's just such a great platform and media to share the work that I do, and also to message those important conservation messages uh, that that we want to get out there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ross Safari just started as an Instagram page to try and get the word out. And then the podcast grew from that. Now I'm also on TikTok and I'm also not great at TikTok, but hey, we're trying and it's, it's important to have that stuff out there, you know? That's um, right. That's right. Just engage that audience with the content. So we'll see how TikTok goes, but it's certainly very much in its infancy. Yeah, no doubt. But um, so yeah, so let's talk about what this job is like and what you're putting up on that Instagram. <laughs> Yes, so there's certainly three key components to my job working here at SeaWorld. A uh, large proportion of my work is obviously looking after all the animals that call SeaWorld home. So looking after all the collection animals that reside here at SeaWorld. Another component of my job is doing all the rescue work. And that's that's the motivating, that's the passion job, getting out there, a wild animal that needs assistance and being that team and being that first respondent is, is such an incredibly privileged position that we can be in at SeaWorld. Um, and the third component of the job is research. We do a lot of research. Research, not only with the animals here at SeaWorld, but also those wild animals that we do rescue. It's so important to assist with the research. And I do have a firm belief that zoological institutions should exist now for the research benefit and that conservation value. It's less about displaying animals and it's more about that conservation output and being able to learn from the animals that we have so we can apply it to those wild populations. So that's the third component of my job. And so it's a big juggling act between those three three sectors or those three key roles. And any every day and any day, anything can happen. There's a lot of planned procedures, but I also like to say my day is made up of mostly unplanned procedures <laughs> because we can get a call any time of day, any day of the week. Um, animals don't know if it's a Sunday or a public holiday, but we're ready to deploy a team and assist an animal in need. I love that so much. And I promise we will get to the rescue stuff. I want to get to your passion. But let's start off with your collection at SeaWorld because y'all have some mm. really cool stuff there. Like this is this is not just like a, a couple of sharks that you're hanging out with. So um, you're doing you're doing what polar bears, right? And penguins and uh, all kinds of crazy stuff. So talk to me a little bit about your collection. Yeah, so we've got a really great uh, collection of animals. We've got two different species of bottlenose dolphins. We have three species of penguins, five species of seals. As you mentioned, we have three polar bears. And then we have a whole a range of aquarium species. So elasmobranchs, which are your sharks and rays, and then a huge, huge, huge variety of teleos, which are your bony fish. So huge collection of animals that do keep me busy, um, a huge proportion of my work with those animals and it should be encompassing 80% of my work is preventative medicine. So just like dogs and cats at home, we vaccinate and we worm them to make sure that they don't become sick. And that's the large proportion of my work with the animals at SeaWorld is, is participating in their veterinary health care to prevent them from becoming unwell. And if I'm doing my job well, then just a small proportion of the work, so 20% of my work on average, is treating those that do succumb to disease or illness. 
All right. That's cool. I, I'm still fascinated by the fact, by the way, that you have all three of these jobs. I feel like each one of the jobs that you described is a um, full time job, if not more of one. So I'm, I'm pretty impressed by that. <laughs> it is a full time job, but um, this is this is my lifestyle. This isn't just a job for me. You know, we're, I'm going to tap into that word passion again. You know, where else would I want to be? Yes, I have a partner at home and, and he is absolutely a priority for me. But this job is not a job. This is a lifestyle. This is a decision. And there's no other place I'd rather be. These animals are, are more than just animals they're, they're team members they're family that they're, they're everything to us and i give them my all so full-time job but uh self-inflicted these hours so <laughs> i can't complain too much well that is that is that is fair and that is a ridiculous collection that is is very cool um do y'all have any sea turtles there or do you do any sea turtle rescue yeah, so sea turtles do make up the majority of our marine rescues. Um, unfortunately, here in southeast Queensland, February last year, we had received a significant flood event, um, which has had huge impacts on our marine ecosystem. So not only has it caused a lot of fresh water to affect the saltwater ecosystem, but it's also killed off a lot of the sea grasses that large sea turtles feed upon and we believe that uh, the multitude or the combination of these effects has caused a disease outbreak in turtles up in the Fraser Coast to down here in this region of Queensland. So prior to this flood event we were receiving on average about 50 turtles per calendar year requiring rescue and rehab um, and that number reached 132 last year. So Ooh. sea turtles, yeah, unfortunately are getting slammed at the moment but we're here we're ready to assist and um, we've made modifications to our rehabilitation resources to accommodate the influx. So a lot of marine turtle work. Very cool. What, uh, what species do you see in that area? Yeah, so mainly green turtles, but we do get the occasional loggerhead and hawksbill as well. Uh, we do get five different species, but we don't see, so flatbacks being the others and leatherbacks being the other, uh, we don't commonly see those other two species. So it's mainly 90% green turtles with the occasional hawksbill and loggerhead. That's so, I, I just find it so fascinating. I, I mean, I understand how oceans work, but the fact that, um, you know, green sea turtles are what we have and loggerheads are what we have and hawksbills are what we have. Like it's, it's crazy to think about that fact. Now, flatbacks, we don't, we don't have, but, um, it's just, it's so interesting to think that as, as far away as you are and the fact that you're in a whole nother day than I am right now. Um, but these, these incredible ancient, you know, turtles just are everywhere. I just, I don't know. I, I just love that. Yeah, and that's one of the beautiful things about marine animals, but more specifically marine turtles, is they have this period of lost years. So they, you know, head out to the ocean as hatchlings and we don't see them return to breeding grounds here or feeding grounds on the coastline until they're sort of 10, 15 years of age. So there's this whole period of lost years. So they're such a cryptic animal um, and what they endure out there in the wild and, and what they must experience around all the continents of the world. They've just got some stories to tell. Absolutely, they do. That's that's very cool. I, I love sea turtles, if you can't tell. Um, <laughs> so, so tell me a little bit about the polar bears there. Yeah, so we've got two males, Nelson and Hudson, um, and then we've got a young female, Mishka. Um, unfortunately, we, we lost Mishka's mum, Leia, to a seizure event uh, about two years ago. So that's mum. And we're not sure, Nelson and Hudson, we're not sure which one is father. So one of them's her father and one of them's her uncle because they are brothers. Um, the interesting story with Nelson and Hudson is they were cubs that were um, from the wild and we acquired them because the mother actually got hunted. Um, they went into care with plans to be able to soft release them, but unfortunately, due to circumstances surrounding the age of those animals, they were unable to be released and bringing them into human care was the best decision. And that's when SeaWorld uh, put a put an offer in to be able to provide them a, a forever home effectively and be able to assist with the, um, the genetic diversity of polar bears across the whole world. So we are uh, 
are heavily involved with the conservation of that species um, around the world. And we do a lot of climate change studies um, and we look at a lot of the impacts that the climate change and the environmental change is having on this species because we know it is having huge impact on wild populations. And having th these three polar bears residing in the southern hemisphere, we do have really good scope to be able to review physiological changes or health implications that might be happening because of climate change. Oh, that's really interesting. I didn't even think about that. That's really very cool. All right. That's that's great. Um, I, I, I it, OK, so I'm going to ask you this question. And if this is not an OK thing, we can like I said, we can edit, we can cut. But. One thing that I'm wondering is there is a lot of debate about cetaceans in captivity right now. And and SeaWorld is, is at the center of a lot of that, in part because of a, a movie that I'm not a big fan of and I think had a lot of issues. And I know that, um, well, it's it's well known that the movie had a lot of issues. Uh, and we'll just leave it at that. But um, I'm curious if you have a take on, especially as somebody who's providing the medical care for these animals, cetaceans in captivity. Yeah, really good topic. And I'm more than happy to talk about it because cool. at the end of the day, in summary, and in short, I'm damn proud of the welfare and the care that we provide our animals. Nice. So that's what it comes down to. Um, I will just say a little caveat. We are SeaWorld and although we share the same namesake as our counterparts overseas, we are a privately owned Australian company that just shares the name. So we are not affiliated with any other SeaWorlds internationally. Not that we wouldn't want to be affiliated with them, but we do have have our own operating procedures and policies and stance and, and basically gives us scope and capabilities to set standards that we want to set. And broadly speaking, zoological institutions in Australia have an incredibly high standard of welfare and animal care when it comes to all species, not just cetaceans under human care. Um, but for me, you know, I, I get asked this question all the time. And for me, it's no different to having, uh, you know, penguins at SeaWorld or koalas at Paradise Country, which is our neighbouring site, or kangaroos at zoological institutions, or heck, my own dog, my domestic dog in my backyard at home. All animals who are under human care deserve to be treated with um, dignity with respect and with the utmost welfare care, and that includes veterinary and health care as well. Um, so I'm, I'm incredibly proud with the huge amount of welfare and enrichment monitoring that we provide all of our species here at SeaWorld, um, the cognitive capabilities that we provide our animals with choice and control, um, different cognitive behaviours, different enriching activities, social arrangements. And I do, you know, people who do question uh, cetaceans in captivity I do empower them to come and see what we do do. Um, I think largely a lot of the, the question, though, isn't so much about the welfare of the animals today. It's more about the future of cetaceans in the wild. So we do receive a lot of um, questioning about breeding of cetaceans in the wild. And I think that's just people trying to um, minimise the future of, of dolphins in the, in the future, as opposed to thinking about the animals' welfare today. And, and as the veterinarian here at Sea world, I think about the animal's welfare today. I'm not thinking about 40 years or 50 years down the line. I'm thinking about sea world today, the animals today, and ensuring that they are thriving, not just surviving, in their environments today and tomorrow and into the short term, not the long term. Um, and I'm damn proud. I, I leave my job every day with my head held high with the level of animal care and the animal welfare that we are able to provide all of our animals here at SeaWorld, not just our cetaceans. But we have external um, welfare specialists who come and review our practices and we have external PhD students who are critically reviewing and scientifically proving or scientifically reviewing I should say our current practices and if they do identify that any of our animals penguins polar bears or, or dolphins are in a state of negative welfare state we will make change. We will alter our operations to suit that, that those animals' needs. Um, so we are proving and we will not anthropomorphize or, or subjectify our, our welfare stance and we will rely on science to, to guide us when it comes to animal welfare and animal care and we do it really damn well here. Really something I'm proud about and I could talk about this for, for hours on end because it's just limitless the amount of data we collect 
daily on each of our individual animals and and collating all that data together to make sure we are doing everything that we can for the animal with the knowledge that we know now. So do you know I mentioned a big component of my work is research and welfare is a big component of that research is we constantly need to be reviewing our understanding of animal welfare because what we know yesterday is different to what we know today and we need to be growing and learning more so our, our knowledge is constantly changing so we can be improving for the animals into the future as well. That was a really great answer. <laughs> I love that. Well, I love how passionate. No, I do. I love how passionate you are about that because that's important. And that's the thing. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons I started this podcast is to shed a light on the good work that is being done by good facilities around the world. And um, I don't know how anybody could listen to what you just said and be like, nah. <laughs> Especially yeah. the fact that it's database. Like, I love that you're passionate about it, but mm. you're you're gathering data and you're doing the research. And I, I genuinely believe that if, you you know, there's some research and like good research. I mean, there's always some crap study out there, but, you know, actual good research and you're doing research and you were finding out that, like you said, any animal in your care was not mm. getting what it needed. You would you would adapt. You would move on. You you know, and I think that's that's super important for people to realize that, like, it's easy to say, oh, they should swim free forever because, yay, happy world. But but you're actually using data rather than emotions. And that's slightly better, I think. <laughs> yeah. And, and the important thing is, is we have those external people coming in because we it is, uh, you know, I am passionate and I invest so much emotion and care and time into the animals that it easy to, it is easy to become complacent in what you're doing and you're operating and, and, and it, it is complacent to think that you are upholding a good standard of care. And then to get someone with a fresh set of eyes who understands the animals that we are looking after and, and critically reviews or evaluates our practices, they sometimes push push the boundaries and, and make change for the better for the animals. So it is important we have those external auditors coming in and, and having a look at our practices as well. And the other thing with welfare is, is we take a proactive as well as a reactive approach. Um, so what that means is if an animal, uh, we do deem it to be in a neutral or negative welfare state, whatever that may be, B, we will react and we will respond and we'll make change to ensure that that animal goes back into a positive welfare state. But also from a proactive perspective, we do conduct what we call animal welfare risk assessments. And we do that for every enclosure or exhibit space that every species resides in. And that's us collectively as trainers, supervisors and managers reviewing any potential animal welfare risks that may be posed to the animal. So it doesn't mean that there has been an animal welfare implication, but we are critically reviewing the space and the operation and how we house and look after those animals in those spaces and identifying what could be a potential animal welfare risk for an animal and will make change based on the scoring system. So that's us being proactive in that animal welfare space and making change before it becomes an animal welfare concern. Awesome. Very cool. Um, we will get to the rescue stuff in just a second, but I have one more question about your facility. You have to tell me the truth. You can't lie and say you don't have one. What's your favorite animal? <laughs> oh, dear. The golden question. <laughs> my, my normal, my, my, my normal cliche response is it changes every day. So based on the clinical cases and, and um, you know, building rapport and, and spending time with individual animals, it absolutely changes every day. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, the one thing I do also say is, oh, you know, friends and family and, and colleagues who come and visit SeaWorld all desperately want to meet a dolphin, all want to, you know, get closer. Everyone's just got this beautiful innate affinity with dolphins. But I instantly say, come and meet a seal. Okay. They're dogs with flippers. Come and meet us here. <laughs> Dolphins are incredible. I'm not going get, I absolutely adore and I'm so grateful to be working alongside dolphins. But seals are just charismatic little rat bags. They truly are. They're just divine. Um, they're dogs with flippers, as I say. And I think because a lot of people do have domestic dogs at home, there is that immediate association between seals and, and, and dogs at homes. And people do just fall in love with seals. But look, no, honestly, for myself, it truly does change. I love the array of animals that I get to work with. And then I go out to a rescue and come across a species that I've never you know, come across before and my mind gets blown and my, and my favorite animal changes again. 
Okay, that's fair. That's different than just saying I can't have one. I I work with them, <laughs> so that's the I'll I'll allow that one. But changes uh, every day. That's fair. So um, let's talk about this rescue stuff. Tell me mm. what you're doing. Tell me what kind of animals you're seeing. Walk me through the whole thing because it is fascinating, and I have not yet had anyone who does marine rescue on this podcast. So like 101, hit us. So uh, it can happen any time of day, any day of week, but I can, if I was to recount the rescue calls, they always tend to fall on a Sunday because that is my day that I try and have off. <laughs> but we, we get calls from department, we get calls from members of public, we get calls from Surf Life Saving, uh, Queensland Fisheries, it, a whole plethora of avenues of a call might come through and it gets funneled down to us because we are the only team um, effectively in Australia that has the capabilities to respond to marine rescues, particularly marine mammal uh, strandings and disentanglement at work so we get a phone call we immobilize appropriate teams so if we're dealing with a marine mammal whether that be a dugong whale or dolphin we'll tap into the the team members who are working on the ground who are working alongside our marine mammals so namely our um, dolphin trainers will assist us with that rescue if we get a turtle call or a shark rescue then we'll tap into the shark bay team and our acris who are working alongside those species every day so just on that point it's a beautiful crossover between conservation and, and having the skill set that we have every day working alongside these animals at SeaWorld and being able to apply them in that wild rescue context. It's really important. So we'll immobilise a team, uh, we'll respond, whether that's via car, by road. Uh, we have two boats that we can utilise and we also have capabilities to use helicopter as well because uh, we do have a few islands here in the Moreton Bay region. So sometimes by going by helicopter is the most efficient way way to get there so we can respond and get to that animal in a timely fashion. Um, we will get there, we'll assess the situation um, and if deemed necessary, we'll bring that animal back to SeaWorld. We have appropriate facilities to house um, marine mammals uh, right down to sea turtles and sea snakes and dugongs, whatever it shall be that we've rescued, house them back here at SeaWorld and provide the rehabilitation they require for release. Uh, so that's always our ultimate goal is to get these animals back out into the wild where they belong. That's I love that so much. And let's let's talk about um, what a rescue is like. I realize that every rescue is different. I know. But despite that fact, walk me through like, uh, you know, just some of the different kinds of things you see and how you have to adapt in the moment and, and how far the vet care goes, you know, on the sand versus once you get to SeaWorld, all that stuff. Yeah, so um, I suppose one of the first things we do as we are travelling to a rescue is providing the people who are there at the scene the appropriate assistance they require to be prov providing, you know, first aid to the animals. So let's talk about a dolphin stranded on the beach. Uh, it needs to be provided with shade. It needs to be kept wet so that skin doesn't dehydrate and those eyes need to be kept nice and wet as well so that they don't um, get any permanent damage to, to the surface of that eye. So we'll be talking talking to those responders on the ground as we're travelling to the location. And then as for me, the very first thing that I need to be doing is assessing the situation to ensure we minimise stress to the animals. So that's largely to do with positioning of the animal, keeping voices down, keeping domestic animals away, keeping crowds at, at a distance and just trying to minimise the amount of disturbance that's going on around that animal, particularly around the head region. Really sensitive area for, for animals, particularly dolphins, uh, dugongs and whales. We really do like to stay away from that rostrum or that head end. And my first task is to ascertain, is this animal a viable animal or does it require immediate euthanasia? So I'll be looking for things like severe trauma, severe dehydration, chronic disease, so very poor body condition, um, debilitating conditions like loss of eyes, um, serious damage to, to limbs. And I might actually, at the very first moment, deem that animal to be a euthanasia candidate and proceed with euthanasia. Um, otherwise, if it's not an immediate euthanasia, I do have capabilities to do some, some diagnostics out in the field. 
So that includes blood work, that includes ultrasound. Um, I do have mobile units that come with me out in the field so I can complete those diagnostic tests. And then if after completing those tests, I still don't find any evident reason for euthanasia, I will suggest that that animal either gets refloated then and there. So that means trying to release it back out into the environment and or taking it back to SeaWorld so I can perform further diagnostics at SeaWorld. So there's a little bit of a step-by-step process. Um, And what I haven't spoken about is during these processes, I do need to seek approval. So these are protected, threatened species. All marine animals are. All Australian native animals are protected species. So depending on where the animal strands, I need to seek approval by the state authorities or the state governing agencies to intervene with the animal. So to being able to take those bloods and do the assessment, but more so bring that animal back to SeaWorld, I need to seek approval before I do that. And we also need to speak with the Indigenous peoples as well. Um, A lot of our Indigenous peoples do have a connection with the marine animals because we do have a lot of coastal communities here. So for any movements of animals or any euthanasia of animals, we do need to engage with our Indigenous communities and seek approval from them as well. Wow. Okay. So I was, I was with you till the end there and then you really surprised me. Um, uh, so what is the process like? You're sitting there and, and you're looking at, you know, an animal that, that has this issue and you know, you can help immediately or, you know, and I, when I say help in this case, I'm talking, especially if it's euthanasia, um, which is helping, uh, or if you're going to need to transport or anything, but then you need to get in touch with the government and indigenous people. How easy is that process? Cause I know what the government is like in the United States and every animal would die immediately and somehow they would find a way to tax it. So, uh, yeah. What is that like for you? Yeah, look, it depends on what day of the week. Certainly the response time is a bit quicker Monday to Friday than it is on a Saturday or Sunday. But I should just make the caveat, although I need to engage with those stakeholders, if an animal is in immediate welfare concern, I do have a legal obligation to speak on behalf of the animal and I will euthanize and then seek, you know, seek for the advice after the fact. But in a marine mammal instance, we certainly do have a little bit of time. But look, it does vary. Um from time to time it can in some instances take a couple of hours to get that approval more so from a transportation rehabilitation perspective so to be able to get the permissions to get that animal back to SeaWorld usually those conversations do take a little bit longer because there's a few more stakeholders that need to give the authority to do that if it is a clear-cut euthanasia it's more so just a courtesy call as opposed to a seeking of approval Um, and with the Indigenous peoples the conversation's more around what what to do with the um, aftercare of the body, more so seeking permission to do the euthanasia versus not. So often the Indigenous peoples would like to bury the um, carcass on land um, and the conversation for me is usually can I still take the carcass back to SeaWorld so I can conduct a post-mortem, I can collect tissue samples so I can be contributing to the scientific world while still respecting that cultural significance and returning the carcass after I've been able to do that. And it's 50-50. In some instances, I am able to bring bodies back to SeaWorld and process them and, and take as much science as I can from that animal. But in some instances, I'm conducting the postmortem on the beach at the rescue location so that the Indigenous peoples can bury the animal then and there on the land. Okay. That's, that's really, that's really interesting to think about. That is, Hmm. um, that is a whole stakeholder that you don't really hear brought into the conversation in the United States with indigenous people. And I think that's very cool. I think that's, that's very important to respect that. Um, I, I, I like that, but I can also see just from a pure, science standpoint that it could be a little frustrating at times too you know Um, it is and it's all about relationship building so I do have some really good relationships now having been in this role for a few years with a lot of the local indigenous communities and so I know the people to talk to they know me there's a mutual respect there they understand I've got that science benefit I you know I understand the huge cultural significance of keeping that animal on the land so we work really well together and it is getting faster and faster as time goes on and 
we, we are respecting each other's discipline. So it's, it's great and it's nice to be able to do both. It's a really nice sentiment to take an animal back and let see the, see the Indigenous peoples do a community. I had a humpback whale calf uh, last year that stranded on a beach here in Gold Coast and as I was euthanising, I had a, an Indigenous gentleman performing a ceremony as that animal was being euthanised and it was absolutely beautiful. It was an absolutely perfect moment because it's hard. As a vet, yes, I'm a scientist. Yes, I'm a clinician. But it's still emotionally taxing and it's still a very, um, you know, big decision to make and be the person that's euthanizing this animal that you just desperately wish you could help. And then to have that cultural ceremony being conducted at the same time was really quite a beautiful sentiment. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I, I do. I really like that. That's that's very interesting. And I love that you said that sometimes you will take the uh, the carcass back to SeaWorld and then back to where the indigenous peoples can uh, bury it. That's that's really cool. I, I, I like that there's that, um, you know, relationship there. Um, that's that's a really and interesting look at it. And that's exactly right. It's a relationship that we've built with those communities that we've now forged, you know, that, that mutual understanding of science and culture. And we're now satisfying both of the disciplines. And it's a really nice place to be in. Very cool. I, I like that a lot. Um, mm. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So, OK, so humpback whale calf. Tell me about some of the other crazy animals that you have gotten to, to see and be part of rescues. And um, and tell me about some of the cases. So I only just, it's so funny you ask this, I only just yesterday did a list because of all the cool species that I've seen in the last 12 months. Because typically here in southeast Queensland, everyone knows we've got dolphin, everyone knows we've got humpback whale. And we do do a lot of dolphin and humpback whale work, um, particularly at winter when we have the, the humpback whale migration. We do get a lot of entanglement issues where they bring up commercial fishing gear on their tails or they get caught up in the fisheries uh, shark control program where we have nets and drum lines along our coastline to try and mitigate shark numbers. So our, our whale disentanglement work definitely ramps up at winter. But just in the last last 12 months, I've said we've been here as the SeaWorld rescue team. We've rescued dugong. We've rescued two different species of dolphins. We've had dwarf sperm whales, Risso's dolphins, melon-headed whale, Blainsville whale, false killer whale, humpback whale, pilot whale and although we didn't rescue it we did visualize southern right whale that's just in the last 12 months that's insane isn't it isn't wow. it just the coolest thing i mean and look a lot of these species are what we call pelagic species so they're species that live way off the continental shelf so the fact that these individuals are stranding of these species it's never really going to be a good outcome uh because they've stranded for a reason we know that um but just an incredible array of different marine mammal species just here in southeast Queensland. So we're talking before about marine turtles, how they just travel and traverse this whole world. Our marine mammals are the same. We've got some incredible species that a lot of members of public and a lot of people who are outside the marine industry, they wouldn't even know half of these species even exist. So it's incredible, to, you know, rocking up to a beach and you see this animal in front of you and you're going oh, my God, what is this? What is this species? Because there's just some incredible marine species out there. Oh, man, that is that is that is absolutely fascinating. Um, what can you walk us through like a case or two that you've done? Because so far you have blown my mind completely, by the way. Like I had this mental image just just to give you an idea. I had this mental image that, OK, so, you know, I, you mobilize and you get on a helicopter or whatever. Like you said, some cool thing and, and really fast rock and roll music plays as you travel to the place and you get off and you're running and you're like, all right, go, go, go. And you're like yelling and screaming. And meanwhile, you're like, I need to calm everybody down. I need to make it quiet. I need to get, and then we need to connect with the government and with indigenous people and blah. And I'm like, this is so different than what I pictured that I would love you to just take us through a case. 
All right. Well, I'll take you through the most recent case that we've seen, um, which was only occurred last Friday. So we got the call at about 9.30 our time. Uh, New South Wales government called. There was a, a report of a dugong had stranded on the beach in northern New South Wales. So that's about a 45-minute drive from where we are. So a mobile, we got a team together. I received the phone call, picked the appropriate team members to come and join me, grabbed my backpack so we have all of our gear packed up, ready to go. So I do just need to grab a paramedics backpack that's my rescue backpack and then I have two eskies that has all of the other bits and pieces including the equipment that I need to attend a rescue got sheets got mattresses got water bottles and got stretchers because we thought we're heading down for a dugong and this is quite an odd location for a dugong to be located. It's a bit southern to where their normal natural range is. So it was a bit concerning to think that there was a dugong down on this particular beach. As we're en route, we're halfway there and we get a call from the National Parks officer who had just arrived on site. And uh, this animal had a dorsal fin. So it was evident it was not a dugong. It had a very large <laughs> dorsal fin. Um, so we were thinking, oh, bugger, we're, we're not attending a dugong. We're attending a very large dolphin or a small whale here. And then when we got there, lo and behold, it was what, what's called a Risso's dolphin, which is, uh, again, one of these species that lives way offshore. It was measuring about three metres in length and over 300 kilos in weight. Um, there was a small crowd there who had already put a sheet over the animal, as we'd instructed them to do. They'd put the animal upright because when they found it, it was on its side with the blowhole underwater, which is not ideal for, for breathing. Um, and they were keeping the animal wet, which was a really good response by the team. Um, because one of the things we do worry about when we attend a stranding on the beach is the sheer crowd that responds. You know, word spreads quickly when there's an animal on the beach. Everyone has an affinity with our beautiful coasts, let alone the animals that live in there. So everyone needs to be there and see, which is which is rightly so. Fortunately, it was just a small crowd, but a, an appropriate um, crowd to be able to assist us with the, the rescue. So I did exactly what I did, got down there and quietened everyone down, ensured the animals in shade ensured the animal was in an appropriate position um, and then started my physical exam, uh, which consisted of a body condition scoring. And this animal wasn't emaciated by any means. It was on the leaner side, but certainly showing no evidence of chronic disease. Uh, eyes were clear, blowhole was clear, breaths were nice and strong and regular, and there was no evidence of any external wounds on the outside. So jumped to my blood gas analyses, which is a blood test I do out on site, and my ultrasound to, to look at lungs for any evidence of pneumonia. Um, and then I can look inside that belly to see if there's any evidence of significant disease. So things I look for is, is there any free fluid um, or suggestion of any sort of ailments in that abdominal region? Ultrasound was clear. Blood gas was normal. Um, so I, may, I quickly called the uh, stakeholders that were on the ground. So I had that um, National Parks uh, staff member there and I instructed him that this animal was not a straightforward euthanasia case, that I'd like to take this animal back to SeaWorld for further diagnostic testing. Um, so he sought the permission. It was good that I already had the a member of the Indigenous community was down on the beach assisting with the rescue. So we already had those guys uh, involved in the decision making, which was great. Um, and we got the approval. So we were able to bring this animal back to SeaWorld, which we did, um, brought the animal back to SeaWorld where I was able to conduct further testing. So that included um, everything from faecal sample, urine samples, x-rays, sputum samples, that's passing a little tube down its blowhole, um, and just basically just checking it over and seeing what it was able to do once it was in the water. The other thing that we need to look out for with stranded animals, particularly large animals like this one that's 300 kilos, like that is a huge weight to be going from being nice and buoyant in the water to suddenly being weight dependent on sand is a condition called muscle myopathy, um, which is where it's basically the muscles become damaged. The muscles aren't used to having all that weight pressing down on them. These animals are largely buoyant in the water. And so myopathy is basically damage to the muscle where those muscles no longer work and those animals can't swim. Uh, fortunately for this animal, it was able to swim. Um, we provided it 24-7 care for a couple of days, waiting for some further blood tests to come back because we do screen these guys for a whole range of infectious diseases that we know that they can get. 
Um, and unfortunately for this little one, it, it had a seizure event, um, which it did not come back from and, and had a cardiac arrest and passed away at day three of rehab. So it's likely had a condition that's called Morbilli virus, which is a virus that affects the brain and the central nervous system of marine mammals, but uh, waiting for post-mortem results to come back on that one. But that's the uh, uh, a rescue that happened this week. That's a bit of a nutshell from woe to go. I mean, these, as I said, these animals do strand for a reason. So the outcome, uh, you know, came as a shock to us all because this animal was giving us no indication previous to the seizure that it was going to seizure or that it was unwell and we were awaiting these blood tests and and talking logistics of release for this animal Um, but unfortunately it it wasn't to be the case in this instance but we wouldn't have changed any of the decisions that we did make for this case and quite a privileged position to be able to provide that that animal with the care that it required in those final moments. Absolutely. Well, I'm sorry that you lost that one, but, uh, you know, it's, it's like you said, it's just amazing that you even gave it three more good days and that, you know, I'll, I'll be curious. You'll have to message me and let me know, um, what the, what the, the final result was, why, why that happened because, uh, I need to know, I, I, I yeah. can't imagine not knowing is just very challenging. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so, uh, sorry to hear that, but that's an incredible story. I mean, the entire thing is, is absolutely incredible. I, uh, I'm curious, you mentioned that you have, um, you know, you, you went out there thinking it was a dugong and then, uh, you found out that it was very much not that. Do you have like a special travel setup for each type of animal or do you just have your standard, you know, the stuff that you were talking about? Is it pretty universal for, for what you're going to find? Yeah, our equipment gear is somewhat universal for what we're going to find. So regardless of whether it was going to be a dugong or, in this instance, a, a Risso's dolphin, we the equipment was appropriate for, for those species at hand. I mean, turtles have specific turtle stretches. Obviously, they're a little bit more circular in nature as opposed to being a longer animal. So we do have specifically designed and, and made stretches for turtles. Um sea snakes and things we do need to ensure that they're in an enclosed container because they're a venomous species but when it comes to the marine mammals it's quite easy to accommodate and use universal equipment regardless of size of that animal wow okay that's very cool um and then i i'm also curious about what like how big and and expansive is your setup back at SeaWorld where you can just bring a dolphin in or or a whale in or a big sea turtle or whatever? What what are you working with? Yeah, so we do have so a huge variety of rehabilitation facilities and resources that we can tap into. So we do have uh, the VQC, which is the Veterinary Quarantine Centre here in the at the park, uh, which is two large pools and three smaller pools. Um, so when I say large pools, they're probably double a standard backyard pool and about three times as deep. So they're, they're quite a large pool that has capabilities for us to use a H-beam that we, goes across the pool so we can lower animals in a stretcher in and out of that pool system so that was the case with this Risso's dolphin we were able to have it in the stretcher attach the stretcher to this gantry and this h-beam and lower it into the pool Um, and then we had it in waist deep water so the pool gives us capabilities to have the water at differing levels depending on the rehabilitation state of the animal so because we were supporting that animal initially because we weren't sure what it was going to do once it was in water so we had a couple of staff members in the water with it at all times we kept that water level at chest to waist height to enable that animal to still move and and undergo physiotherapy and and normal motions um but having been you know making it safe enough that staff could stay in with that animal at all times so it is an incredibly deep pool uh, look, this Risso's dolphin at three metres, we probably can't go much larger than that with the facilities that we have. Um, so we are a little bit constrained with um, the larger animals. Um, but certainly this Risso's dolphin, where our facilities were more than satisfactory to provide the rehabilitation care that an animal of that size needed. That's very cool. Is it hard? You know, I spend all my time talking to zookeepers and aquarists who spend all their time training their animals so that they are able to participate in in their health care. How hard is it having a bunch of animals from the wild that you have probably not done much training with? (laughs) 
Yeah, really good question because that's one of the joys of working with the collection animals here at SeaWorld is they do voluntarily participate in their own health care, which is an absolute joy for me. It makes my life less stressful, makes the animal's life less stressful and enables me to conduct and collect diagnostics of all of our animals at SeaWorld in, in a minimal stress capacity and, and the animals are voluntarily participating. It's an incredible thing to, to participate in. Um, and then, yeah, as you say, you bring an animal in from a wild where suddenly it's in a foreign environment. You've got, you know, foreign, it's never been around humans before. You have to absolutely do a backflip on all of the, um, you know, husbandry skills that you have for, for that species. But your handling still skills are still applicable. And as a veterinarian, all of the skills that and knowledge that I have about the species is still applicable. So um, in these instances, we do utilise chemical immobilisation a little bit. So um, taking the edge away if an animal is highly anxious or or is not coping um, in those initial periods in that rehabilitation space, we can use things like midazolam and, and Valium just as an anti-anxiety medication, just to take the stress away for that animal to recuperate um, and for those muscles to repair um, for us to get supportive care into that animal like IV fluids or, or oral fluids um, depending on where that animal's at getting medications on board sometimes we do use uh, yeah a combination of those chemical immobilizing drugs to help us with that and or we use manual restraint so whilst that animal's in a stretcher it's a good opportunity to be able to apply some of the the medical interventions that ad- that animal needs but yeah it, it's somewhat challenging and it's a, it adds a complexity to rehabilitation because you you do apply the skills that you have uh, working alongside the animals here at SeaWorld to a degree, but you don't have any of that conditioning or training that you used to. Yeah, that's that's really interesting to think about. That's very cool. Uh, well, okay, so we're we're winding down time wise. I know that you have to go save animals, but would you would you tell me about one more case? Maybe just something weird or interesting that was a little a uh, little different than than the norm, maybe. Look, I, it's one that, that is on Instagram, so you can go and check it out and see the footage for yourself. But I had this turtle come in. It was a it was a sub-adult green turtle, so the 15 to 20 kilo size, which is the typical size that we see present to rehabilitation. And it wasn't using its back, let me think about this, back left flip, back left leg was just was not moving as as well as it should have been. Um, Every turtle, when they arrive, gets bloods, x-rays, and I analyse some of their faeces to look for foreign bodies, like fishing line, and to look for parasites. And on this particular occasion, I was interested to see what was going on with this back leg, Um, so obviously conducting those x-rays, and there was a really weird, obscure foreign body under the skin of the the turtle in the in the front of this limb and it was a really I could not work out what was going on palpating around the limb I could kind of feel a hard object just sitting beneath the skin um, and just couldn't quite work out I couldn't see an entry point I couldn't work out whether it was um, a parasite or or whether it was completely in front of the musculature or whether it was actually communicating with the cavity so I left it to take Take this animal to surgery so I could explore this this weird object that I could feel and I could see on x-ray. So I anesthetized this turtle and did a little bit of an exploratory surgery in the area that I could feel it and I was absolutely gobsmacked with what I found. I found the largest stingray barb protruding in front of the limb of this turtle into the abdominal cavity or it's called a coelomic cavity of a turtle it was that large Whoa. and so i removed this this stingray barb had to have a little look around to make sure there was no infection or it hadn't damaged any of the internal organs and happy to say it was all actually encapsulated really well stitched this little guy up and 
The next day, he was using the limb far better than he was. <laughs> Previous, so it was obviously just like a splint. It was kind of just obscuring his movement that he couldn't move that limb forward. So that was just a really odd case. I don't think I'm ever going to remove a stingray barb from a turtle again. Because if you think about it, they've got their top shell and their bottom shell. There's only a very small window of opportunity for a stingray to be able to barb a turtle. Yeah. So it's incredibly unfortunate that this happened in the first place, but the sheer size of this barb, it must have been a huge stingray because the barb itself was incredibly large. So a really, really cool case, really unexpected outcome, and we were subsequently able to release this turtle, which was a really cool outcome. I love that. That's so fascinating. That is so cool. Um, well, thank you so much for that. And if people want to help or you know donate to your cause or anything, what, what, what can people do to help? Yeah, so we do have a SeaWorld Foundation, which is our non-for-profit arm of our SeaWorld operation. So currently, um, the SeaWorld Foundation does support all of our rescue efforts and, and looks after the operating side of all of our, our rescue efforts. So you can check out uh, the SeaWorld Foundation on our SeaWorld website. Uh, there's a link and a tab that will take you to SeaWorld Foundation. And from there, you can see a lot of the rescue stories that we do and some of the research projects that that SeaWorld Foundation is also heavily involved. Involved with. So yeah, absolutely go check it out and see some of the cool work that we do and um, some of the research that we're looking to do forward to do into the future as well. It's time now, don't you know? We've come to the end of the show. But there's one tale left to go. You're gonna laugh and say, oh no. It's time for the Ron Silvari Poop Story. Oh, golly, I have so many cool, <laughs> gross stories to share with you guys. But look, so one of the really key parts of doing research with our rescue uh, foundation is being able to collect as much data and as much samples as we can from our animals. And one of those is going through the gastrointestinal contents of a turtle just to see what diet that turtle is eating, but also what stuff that turtle is eating that it shouldn't be eating. And just as recent as last week, I had a green turtle that had a lot of poop from stomach right through down to the column. And I was there for an hour and a half with the sift, sifting through <laughs> feces, trying to find, because you have to get rid of all the organic to find the inorganics. And at the beginning of that hour and a half, I had gloves on, but at the end of that hour and a half, from using my fingers, which is probably the most revolting technique I could have utilised, <laughs> the sift had actually worn through the finger, the gloves at my fingertips, and I'd had that many holes, and I might as well have just not been wearing gloves, and I was sifting through turtle feces, <laughs> basically with my fingers ungloved, which is so revolting. <laughs> And I do not recommend it for anyone at home because you can get diseases from them. So there is a OH&RS risk. But, gee, I could do nothing but just laugh at my own expense. <laughs> and the worst part is I had nobody to share it with. So it was one of those defining moments where you're like, I just want to laugh about this scenario because it's just so revolting. Anyway. And now I'm sharing it with all of you. <laughs> Sifting through turtle poo with ungloved fingers was a highlight of my week last week. Well, that is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Oh, You're man. welcome. <laughs> uh, is there anything else that you want to say before I let you go? Just that our marine ecosystems are just a beautiful world that we out there exploring the waterways, we only see the surface of it. So get below the water surface, get out there, appreciate that beautiful marine ecosystem that our world has to offer and do your bit to help preserve the, the ecosystem for future generations to enjoy because unfortunately it's dying um, at quite a dramatic rate. And if we don't do something collectively, we will lose it. And it's it's too beautiful to lose, guys. Love it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been so much fun. All right. 
right. So there you have it, folks. Uh, just another incredible interview. I found Dr. Madden to be so inspirational. And I, I can't help but think about just the sheer quantity of work that she does. As she was talking about all of those rescue things, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm talking to a person who does marine mammal rescue and sea turtle rescue, and that's really cool. And then I'm like, oh, wait, she's also the vet at SeaWorld Australia. I forgot that part. And she also runs a really hop in Instagram, like, and has a personal life. Like, it's it's all just, I mean... What a cool, awesome, and just put together person. I occasionally struggle to play the drums for two hours a day and uh, make two podcast episodes a week. So I'm um, a little intimidated, but mostly just inspired by uh, Claire. She's awesome. Uh, I'd like to um, thank everyone at uh, SeaWorld Australia for allowing this interview to happen. Um, I, I know that y'all didn't know me before this, and I'm, I'm glad that you do now. And uh, I'm, I'm so grateful to have, have Claire on. On the podcast. So thank you very much. Speaking of saying thank you very much, I would also like to say thank you to all of my patrons, especially my Red Panda level patrons, Laura Shank, Kristen Dickey, and Stephen Williamson. And remember, my friends, the word credits backwards is, you guessed it, Steiderk. The Rossafari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Rossafari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Rossafari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.